Hello, Richard Dick Coughlin. How are you? In May of this year, Ian Hersey Ali gave a speech in Germany, which he entitled The Advocates of Silence. The overall message of the speech was outlined by her at the start. She said, I want to talk about the freedom of speech and the loss of freedom that comes with that silence, which is as good a subject as any to make a speech about. However, many of the things Ian Hersey Ali proceeded to say are, in my opinion, not only quite stupid, but also downright irresponsible. These are the points that I wish to address in this video. I can already foresee people accusing me of quote mining or straw manning Miss Ali, so I will point out now that there is a full transcript of the speech linked below, and I urge you all to read it for yourself. If you do wish to accuse me of distorting her message, please do take the time to tell me exactly how I've done so, rather than just making the claim and not explaining yourself. I find this immensely annoying. She begins by talking about the film that she made with Theo van Gogh in 2005 called Submission that ultimately resulted in the tragic murder of Mr. Van Gogh at the knife-wielding hands of a radical Muslim. I shouldn't have to say this, but I know that this is the internet and some people are just too stupid for words and that they require me to spell everything out to them. So, FYI, what happened to Theo van Gogh was disgusting, unjustified, unforgivable and indefensible. Nobody deserves to be killed or even attacked simply for expressing themselves. The best response, in my opinion, is to do what I'm doing right now. OK? Let's continue. Mrs Ali continues. Today the problem of how to integrate Muslim immigrants into European society is, if anything, even more complex and challenging than it was then. Then being 2005. Now it has become an accepted and common belief that Muslims in Europe are not integrating well into society. This is certainly true in some cases, but is it the norm? Do Muslims tend to form communities within countries they live, in which they are a minority? Yes. But how is this any different than Jewish communities that are formed in various parts of countries? Amish communities, immigrant group X nationality communities, black communities, or even gay communities? There is a higher gay population in San Francisco and New York than there is any other part of America. Are we going to accuse gay people of not integrating? People have always tended to naturally gravitate towards areas and places where they can instantly feel more comfortable and have a sense of belonging. This is truer of minorities than anyone else. In the UK, Muslim integration is always seen as a problem, and to prove this, people will bring up various questionnaires, statistics and data from studies. I wonder what those people will make of the findings from a recent study by the University of Essex, which actually suggests the exact opposite in regards to Muslim integration. All the relevant links for what I'm about to tell you are below, and I urge you all to check them all for yourself. The most interesting findings from this study were 83% of Muslims are proud to be a British citizen, compared to only 79% of the general public. 77% of Muslims strongly identify with Britain, while 50% of the wider population do. 86.4% of Muslims feel they belong in Britain, slightly more than the 85.9% of Christians. 82% of Muslims want to live in diverse and mixed neighbourhoods, compared to 63% of non-Muslim Britons. 90% of Pakistanis feel a strong sense of belonging in Britain, compared to 84% of white people. Whilst there is no doubt an issue with small organised group of militant Islamists in the UK and Europe, we must also consider this that Muslim integration, in fact any integration of any outsider, is not a one-way street. The rest of us have to make sure that we are doing what we can to enable their integration of any minority into our country. One possible reason for any Muslim feeling like an outsider may be the way that the general public perceive them as people. Below I will link to a study conducted in 2011 by academics at Lancaster. Entitled The Representation of Muslims in the British Press between 1998 and 2009, the researchers analysed over 200,000 media articles, amounting to apparently 143 million words, written on the subject of Islam and Muslims over an 11 year period. The study found that a lot of reporting on stories regarding Islam and Muslims used fair and detailed language and did not generalize them. However, almost every example of stories that did generalize Muslims were found in either The Sun or The Daily Mail, the former being the biggest selling English language newspaper in the world. The readership of these two papers alone overshadow all the other publications readership combined. Is it possible that this has contributed to the following statistics, again links below. 47% of Britons see Muslim as a threat. Only 28% of Britons believe Muslims want to integrate into British society. 52% of Britons believe that Muslims create problems. 45% of Britons admit that they think there are too many Muslims in Britain. 55% of Britons would be concerned if a mosque was built in their area. 58% of Britons associate Islam with extremism.
Now, I'm not for one minute suggesting, as many people would like to, that all Muslims are lovely, wonderful people, and that none of them are bad or evil. There are many, many detestable and despicable human beings who are also Muslim. But I do feel that the fear and anxiety that surrounds them now does seem to be disproportionate, and on the whole, unnecessary. But I'll let you draw your own conclusions. Ayn Hirsi Ali continues, There are, of course, still the advocates of silence. Now, the advocates of silence is apparently a new term, I presume coined by Miss Ali herself. It sounds as if she is suggesting that there is a group or collective who wish for certain ideas and opinions to be silenced or suppressed. However, the word advocate simply means a person who argues for or in defence of a certain idea or case. Advocation is not about forced silence or censorship of anything. And surely freedom of speech, the very subject Miss Ali is talking about, covers people who think that silence is a better option and wish to tell others. I don't agree with that sentiment. I support speaking out on most issues most of the time. But people also have the right to not only stay silent, but to argue that others should do the same, whether we like it or not. Freedom is a two-way street. If you think that she was referring to people like Theo Van Gogh's killer, then think again, because she continues. They say that an honest discussion of the challenges posed by some Muslim immigrants to European society will lead to a build-up of hatred against those immigrants. A hatred so vile and so strong as to translate into violence. A violence carried out by lone renegades like Norwegian Anders Brevik, now on trial for his horrific spree in Oslo last year or a more organised violence by neo-Nazi groups. And my issue with Ayn Hirsi Ali's use of the term advocates of silence lies in this very sentence. Who exactly are they? To whom is she referring to when she uses the advocates of silence? Surely if this group of people, who are so numerous and causing such big problems for all of us who want to have this discussion, then surely it should not be too difficult for her to give us at least a few names. Is it unreasonable and unfair for me to demand that she specifically out some of these people? It would also help if she can give examples, times, dates, etc., when any or all of these people have made the specific argument she just claimed they did, or ones she's about to claim later on. Terms like they and the advocates of silence mean nothing on the surface. Using these vague and undefined terms leaves the listener with no choice but to fill in the blanks and assume. She has left this speech open to huge amounts of personal interpretation by the audience. And if the Bible and the Quran have taught me nothing else, it's that personal interpretation is about what you want to believe and not what is true. I strongly suspect Ayn Hirsi Ali has done this on purpose, because as the speech continues, she says... The advocates of silence also warn that honest discussion will encourage the emergence and rise of populist parties whose only political issue is immigration and Islam. I would like Ayn Hirsi Ali to define what she means by honest discussion. Is she suggesting there is little or no discussion about Islam that is honest? Interestingly, the study I mentioned earlier about the portrayal of Muslims in the media could suggest that much of the dishonesty is actually coming from the side of the debate that she herself is ideologically connected and linked to. And once again, who is making this argument? She continues, They fear the election through non-violent means of politicians with a violent agenda that they will apply to Muslims as soon as they get into office. Again, who said this? I don't fear a non-violent election personally. Most elections in Europe are not violent. And as far as violent agenda applied to Muslims, well, I think there's a lot of Muslims already in the Middle East who would feel that this has already taken place. I'm sure Ayn Hirsi Ali is very familiar with her fellow Dutchman, Gert Wilders, uh, who is leader of the PVV, the uh, unfortunately not ironically named Dutch Freedom Party. If you spend 10 minutes simply researching him, it's quite clear that he has a multitude of laws, legislations and policies that will apply to Muslims and Muslims only. Banning mosques, banning burqas or taxing people who wear them, and banning Muslim immigration or immigration from Muslim countries. Then let's consider the rise of right-wingers like the BNP and the EDL in Britain, and to a lesser extent the UK Independence Party. Then there's the Golden Dawn Nazi Party in Greece. Recently in America, the Nazi Party over there has got their first ever lobbyist. I think there is good reason for some people to look at the far right's recent ascension and feel concerned, don't you? She goes on. Advocates of silence conjure up terrifying visions of fascistic re regimes that will implement mass deportation of Muslims, mass imprisonment of Muslims, the closing of their mosques, the shutting down of their businesses, the exclusion of Muslims from education and employment, and other types of discrimination. I do think that if a fascistic regime that she is referring to gets into power, the last thing they're going to do is give the Muslims a cake. I do wonder if Ayn Hirsi Ali is actually aware of the fact that some of the things she just listed off actually apply 
to Gert Wilders. Whilst I think that there is currently only a very small threat of any implementation of a right-wing government occurring, that doesn't mean we should be complacent or dismissive towards them, particularly when you take into account that most of these nationalistic anti-Islamic organisations and promoters are themselves Christian fundamentalist. Nick Griffin of the BNP has stated that he wants to keep Britain a white Christian nation, and the EDL have said similar, minus the bit about the white part. Now, last time I checked, the BNP and the EDL alone have hundreds of thousands of supporters and voters. How many Islamic political parties are there in the UK right now? Islam for UK, led by Anjum Chowdhury, tried to do it, but they no longer exist after the UK government made membership of their organisation illegal, as was their spin-off group, Muslims Against Crusaders. I would have to ask Miss Ali, who is responsible for advocating the silence of those groups? When voicing these fears, she says, the advocates of silence point implicitly or explicitly to the history of Germany between the world wars. To be fair, I agree with her, and I think she's right on this. However, the problem arises when you look at how many people on the other side do it too. After all, it was Gert Wilders who compared the Koran to Mein Kampf. Pat Gondel once said in his No Mosque at Ground Zero video that we don't need to make allowances for Islam any more than we do Nazism. Pamela Geller and Robert Spencer have made more Nazi Muslim comparisons than it's possible for me to even bloody remember. And you know who else has made this comparison? Yes, Ayn Hirsi Ali herself. One example of her doing this would be in the Metro newspaper in London in a 67 interview that was printed when she was asked if she saw a positive side to Islam and she replied, that's like asking if I see a positive side to Nazism. Ayn Hirsi Ali should learn that people who live in glass houses, etc, etc. She continues, citing this history of intolerance and genocide, these advocates of silence demand that no specific references be made to Islam or Muslims when discussing the issue of integration, such as who, where and when. I'm not denying that this has occurred. I am just asking her to provide me some evidence. Sorry if that's inconvenient. She goes on, they also urge that cultural demands made by some Muslim leaders be accommodated without complaint. Again, like... She says animal rights groups are asked to look the other way when it comes to the ritual slaughter of sheep, cows and chickens. As opposed to, of course, the traditional slaughter of animals for food, which animal rights groups are all in favour of, aren't they? I'm pretty sure they're against the slaughter and mistreatment of all animals. What's more, in Europe, all animals that are killed within Europe to be sold as meat in the EU have to meet EU standard slaughtering ethics guidelines. This means that halal meat cannot be prepared in the same way. In fact, its preparation in Europe would be almost identical to that of kosher products. However, if halal meat is being purchased from non-EU countries, a very good example of this would be New Zealand, then only the, only the standards of that country would apply. But the animal is definitely dead when it's brought to Europe for sale. So, what the hell is Ayn Hirsi talking about here? If she's referring to anyone having a private ritual slaughter of an animal in a way that is cruel and unnecessary, then she doesn't need to worry because we already have laws in place that protect animals from such behaviour and punish people who commit them. She goes on, Women's rights groups are told to look for other issues when they agitate against women's only swimming pools, the veil, forced marriages, gentle mut mutilation and even honour killings. Now I have to wonder if she's still talking about Europe here, because I'm pretty sure that killing and murdering people is still illegal throughout most if not all of Europe. The veil, to my knowledge, along with the burqa, has been openly debated and discussed for many, many years, and mutilating genitals, in my opinion, shouldn't be tolerated regardless of the gender of the baby it's being performed on, so this would include and extend to Jewish male circumcision. Or should I not say that, lest I be accused of anti-Semitism and have my video taken down by the Anti-Defamation League? Yes, advocates of silence come in many different forms, Miss Ali. She goes on, activists may condemn the killing of women and the forcing of girls into marriage, but they may not link it to religion of Islam or the community of the Muslims. At this point, I really don't think I need to continue repeating my demands for just one goddamn example of anything she has just said, so I won't, but I do hope that many of you are currently feeling my frustration. So I'll skip along to the next important bit of her speech. She says, The advocates of silence warn us that publishing these facts or debating them in the media and in Parliament will transform the existing resentment towards Muslims into violent behaviour. I think when you look at the attacks on mosques and Muslims, uh, Muslim-owned businesses by the likes of the EDL and BNP members, that maybe the, the advocates of silence have a point, whoever the fuck they might be. Let's not forget the endless stupidity that spewed forth regarding the stupidly referred to Ground Zero Mosque or the more actually named Park 51 Community Centre, during which time a Muslim taxi driver in New York was stabbed in the face by a Christian man simply because he was Muslim. Ayan Hirsi Ali seems content to deny or dismiss the attacks and the hate crimes that Muslims have endured, which I find completely despicable, because whilst freedom of speech is important, 
So is freedom to not be assaulted by some right-wing nutter, and so is freedom to not be sent to Guantanamo Bay for four years without trial and tortured to the point where you admit that you were part of a terrorist training cell that you were never actually a part of. She carries on. Censorship and silence, we are told, are the best preventative remedies against hatred and violence. I personally think that rationality, logic and common sense are the best weapons we have. Apparently, Ayan Hirsi Ali thinks the best approach is to make baseless accusations towards this mysterious group whose members are completely unknown and unnamed and whose actions she cannot even provide one example of. To be silent about this, in my view, is counterproductive. Yes, it would be, I agree. And as soon as she can provide me with enough evidence to show that enough people think the exact opposite of that, then suddenly everything she's just said might start to begin to make some fucking sense. Ayan Hirsi Ali goes on to list various ways in which silence is bad and why it should be avoided. None of these are worth mentioning until she gets to the very last one, number four. She says, Fourthly and finally, that one man who killed 77 people in Norway because he fears that Europe will be overrun by Islam may have cited the work of those who speak and write against political Islam in Europe and America, myself among them, but he does not say in his 1500 page manifesto that it was these people who inspired him to kill. So Anders Breivik feared that Europe would be overrun by Muslims, and he cited, among others, Ayn Hirsi Ali as one of the people whose work was responsible for giving him this idea and affirming his beliefs. But you can't blame her for what he did, she is saying, and I would agree with her. It's wrong to accuse her of being responsible in any way for what he did. She is not responsible for the actions of Anders Breivik. Only he is and should be held accountable for what he did. But apparently Ayn Hirsi Ali disagrees with me. She goes on to say that he says very clearly that it was the advocates of silence because all outlets to express his views were censored. He says he had no other choice but to use violence. Wait a minute. Is she saying that Anders Breivik used the phrase advocates of silence in his manifesto? No, he doesn't. So he must have been referring to other people. So who was he referring to that she is referring to as advocates of silence? Apparently, Ayn Hirsi Ali was far too busy to extract a single quote from Anders Breivik's manifesto for us. It's quite clear to me at this point that she is not only just quoting what Anders Breivik said, she's actually using it as a way of backing up her argument. The fact that she felt the need to mention the fact that she was mentioned in his manifesto and then immediately deflect and say it wasn't her fault, and then to try and place the blame, as he'd suggested, on the shoulders of those who she calls the advocates of silence confirms this suspicion of mine. Her constant invoking of this monolithic evil that known simply as the advocates of silence is at worst underhanded pandering and lazy argumentation. But for her to then use Anders Breivik and his quotes to place the blame of him murdering 77 innocent people squarely at the feet of these people that she is far too lazy or cowardly to name is quite frankly hideous. So Anders Breivik's views were subject to so much censorship that he was ultimately forced to take the only action available to him, violence, terrorism and mass murder. In short, it would appear that Ayn Hirsi Ali thinks that Anders Breivik had no choice but to carry out the systematic slaughter of 77 people, many of whom were young children, because he wasn't allowed to express his opinion. I have to ask Miss Ali at this point, were the people that Anders Breivik killed the advocates of silence? Do you think that these people helped contribute to this poor man's decision to go out and murder them? I would love to hear her answer to that question, but before she considers that, I have a lot of other ones to ask her too. When Ayn Hirsi Ali says bad things about Islam, including publishing best-selling books, where are the advocates of silence to censor her? When Michael Savage, the American shock jock, says on his radio show that all Muslims are terrorists, where are the advocates of silence to censor him? When Anne Coulter says that the US should invade the Middle East and convert them all to Christianity, which, interestingly, is something Ayn Hirsi Ali herself has also said, where are the advocates of silence to censor her? When Glenn Beck said that 10% of Muslims were terrorists, where are the advocates of silence to censor him? When Pat Condell uploads videos invoking ideas like stealth jihad and spouting his Islamophobic propaganda, where are the advocates of silence to censor him? When the EDL decide to have a march in public in the UK every weekend for the last three fucking years, where are the advocates of silence to censor them? When Pamela Geller publishes endless anti-Islamic bullshit on her website, where are the advocates of silence to censor her? When Robert Spencer posts another stupid blog on his jihad watch site, where are the advocates of silence to censor him? When the Daily Mail prints story after story about the so-called Muslim menace, where are the advocates of silence to censor them? When Gert Wilders compares the Quran to Mein Kampf proposes banning mosques and burqas, where are the advocates of silence to censor him? When Tommy Robinson says that a picture of a mosque on the front page of Twitter is an example of creeping Sharia, where are the advocates of silence to censor him? When Terry Jones, the American pastor, decided to burn Qurans on 9-11 and he was free to do so, where were the advocates of silence to censor him? When the Daily Star printed made-up stories 
stories about Muslim-only toilets in certain building sites. Where are the advocates of silence to censor them? When disgusting Daily Mail journalist hack Melanie Phillips wrote her obviously racist book, Londinistan, where were the advocates of silence to censor her? I could list many more people who have done many more things and asked the exact same question of them, but I think you've probably got the message by now. So, Ian Hirsi Ali, please tell me this. If the advocates of silence are such a big problem in Europe and the West, then please explain to me how you and everyone else I've just mentioned has managed to get away with saying and doing the things that you have for so long, and at no point have you been forced into a corner by censorship to the point where the only choice you felt you had left was to go out and kill 77 people. I don't know if Ian Hirsi Ali would classify me as a member of the advocates of silence. However, the irony is, after reading her speech, I do have to say that maybe in future she should consider keeping her mouth shut. Thank you for listening. Richard the Dick Coughlin, 616. Good night. May God be less.